My talk today is a little bit unusual in terms of title, but hopefully by the end of it, it'll be clear. Uh, so my title is Getting Uphill on a Candle, and if any of you are rocket enthusiasts, that reference will be clear. Crush spines, detach retinas, and one small step. So um, actually, I'm going to move this fellow right over. Awesome. All right. So on July 20th, 1969, a quiet moon set foot. On, a quiet man set foot on the moon. Boom. Um, <laughs> on December 13th, 1972, an outgoing man from Chicago was the last one to step off of the moon. We talk about the Apollo project now as if it's too big to ever do again, as if as if it was this thing that could only have occurred once. And now, as 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 a species, we've lost something essential. Um, to itself, that, that we're not capable of doing this sort of thing again. But I don't think that we have. You know, I, I, think, I think the Apollo project was very special, but I do think we can do it again. Um, and in this talk, I want to explore how we did it, why we did it, and how we're going to do it again. So, 1903, North Carolina. Orville Wright takes, the, or takes off in the Flyer 1. Uh, this is the first powered flight in human history. Uh, people have been trying to do it for 200 years, and no one has quite managed not to die doing it. And Orville Wright is the first one not to break a bone, and he flies for 12 seconds. The Wrights continued their research. So they were originally bicycle mechanics, and they were amateur engineers and amateur physicists. And they continue their research, and they begin selling it in the US. They want to preferentially sell it in the US, primarily to the Army for reconnaissance purposes. But American society has this peculiar thing where we love technology, so long as we made it, ignored it, other people used it, and then we love it. <laughs> and that happens with the aircraft. We basically ignore it, but people in Europe immediately see the potential. The Industrial Revolution has been going for a while. There is clearly a competition between these great powers, and they see the need for more and more technology. And by 1910, advances are being made independently in Europe using adapted Wright Brothers technology. And it's feeding back. People are writing papers. You have a, a, a modern world, even though you don't have the internet yet. Um, so communication is relatively slow. It has to go by boat. But people are doing science. People are doing engineering. But it's a very sort of uh, haphazard thing. You have, and this might be familiar to people in software, you have these sorts of very uh, intrepid people going out into the world. And they're saying, I know what to do. And they don't know what to do. And things fall out of the sky. The US is the world leader in aeronautics research. So the Wright brothers are still doing their thing. They formed the Wright company at this time. But they have protégés. They have, uh, uh, you have people that will eventually have companies named after them. Uh, people named Lockheed, uh, people named Boeing, things like that. So the US is doing great. We're, we're doing great with flight. And then the Great War happens. So the Great War is very interesting. Um, you have the Industrial Revolution, and you have this revolution in human society. And you have all of these medieval tensions that's keep, that have, have been persisting, but you know, running up to people with spears or running up to people with musket, muskets that you then have to pack, like that's not a great way to run a war. But the Industrial Revolution happens, and we have the ability to make really impressive explosives, and people think, you know what? And so the Great War occurs. <laughs> so early aircraft, they are not for combat. They are fragile. They are unreliable. You can really only stick one person in them. And if the person is too large, they won't fit. So jockeys get used in aircraft because they're tiny enough to ride them. <laughs> Early aircraft are used for reconnaissance purposes. Um, so if you read Zelensky's uh, 1914 August, he'll talk about the Russian aircraft that are uh, not terribly reliable, but when they are used, they're only used for reconnaissance purposes. They fly over. People can't even conceive of shooting at them because they're non-combatants. This lasts until a Frenchman takes a machine gun, up, machine gun up in a reconnaissance craft, flies by another reconnaissance craft, and blows the guy out of the sky. <laughs> Aircraft are now combat vehicles. <laughs> so the great power advances uh, in aeronautics, they happen rapidly. They're unreliable, but they're using them for combat vehicles. So they, well, what happens if we add more wings? And then they try and fly it, and it doesn't work, or it does work. Uh, they, reorient propellers so the things go faster. Uh, meanwhile, the US is just sitting there twiddling its rudders. We're not in the war. We have Woodrow Wilson, who doesn't want us in the war. Um, and when we do eventually enter the war, uh, we're obligated to buy French aircraft, which is just galling to people uh, at the time. Uh, so in 1915, Washington, DC, Woodrow Wilson has NACA formed. 
So NACA is the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. Um, it is primarily copied from the UK version of this department, but it is a government agency conducting basic R&D for the benefit of American industry. So it is intended to take these scattershot developments and turn them into practical research that industry can then use. So it's government funding private industry through basic research, which everyone is allowed to use. So in 1922 in Langley, Virginia, uh, NACA turns on its variable density wind tunnel for the first time. So you're actually empirically capable of studying aircraft. In 1928, also in Langley, Virginia, NACA develops the NACA cowl, which is aerodynamic engine cooling. So previously, what people would do for aircraft engines is they would stick the hot parts out into the airstream, which has the obvious advantage of radically cooling the device, but it pro provides drag. So this aircraft is modified to hold the NACA cowl. The unmodified uh, top airspeed is 190 kilometers per hour. The top airspeed of this craft is 230 kilometers an hour. Same engine, same everything. It just doesn't stick the hot bits out in the airstream. Really interestingly, uh, in 1934 in Langley, Virginia, NACA is able to take a photograph of an airfoil shock wave. So now you don't have to build a full aircraft. You can stick it in your wind tunnel and you can see what the airflow is like because the calculus to solve this sort of thing is too complex for the slide rules available at the time. Uh, so American aviation begins making great strides, and in 1934, there was a race from London to Melbourne. And all through the 20s and all through the 30s, there's this race from London to Melbourne. And people have been building custom race aircraft. Uh, the DC-2, which is what you see pictured here, is a passenger aircraft. It's designed to carry 20 people. It leisurely keeps up with the custom race aircraft from the UK, carrying 20 people along for the ride. So, because of all of this empirical research, you know, these craft are able to radically outperform the sort of like hot dog, uh, cowboy style craft of aircraft engineering. Back to the Great War. Let's talk about artillery. So this was the single biggest threat to infantry in World War I. It is the thing that killed the most people other than the flu, but <laughs> artillery has a real problem. Artillery is extremely difficult to maneuver. It's a big gun, you have to move it around. Uh, if you happen to get swamped by other infantry, you lose your artillery. Tanks are interesting because they can span trenches, which is what the English originally used them for, but you still have to have them right in the action. Airplanes increasingly are interesting, but they have a tendency to fall out of the sky if you plug the pilot. So what's wanted by world militaries is a remote weapon, something that you can deploy remotely without risking anybody. So people have been thinking about this and people start funding it. Now, in 1923 in Gottingen, Germany, um, a, uh, a physicist named uh, Hermann Oberth published this, the Die Rocket zum den Planetenraumen, which is the, the rocket to outer planetary space. I've seen various translations of this. The worst is how to get to space. <laughs> <laughs> but he is the first person to scientifically study how you would go about constructing a rocket. Now, that's not entirely true. There are other people doing it, but he's the first one that's engineering-minded. So you can actually see that at the back half of this rocket, which is on the my extreme right, is a thrust chamber, and you have various liquid fuel containment vessels inside. He didn't build any of these. He just sort of spec them out. In 1926, in Auburn, Massachusetts, Robert Goddard, who's working independently from Oberth, although we believe now that he was aware of the research, but they, they sort of worked independently of one another, achieves the first flight of a liquid-fueled rocket. Now, this is huge. Now, this doesn't look like a rocket. He's actually standing next to it. The liquid fuel container is at the bottom, and it has an asbestos con cone on the top, and the thrust chamber is at the extreme top of the device. Um, completely archaic, very interesting that we couldn't do the math to figure out how to actually shape these things, so he had to fly them off. Now, his paper on this flight casually mentions sending a probe to the moon. You would just launch a thing filled with TNT, crash it into the moon, and then we would use a telescope to look at the explosion and go, yeah, we, we touched the moon. <laughs> <laughs> He's promptly ridiculed in the New York Times, the front page. They say that Dr. Goddard has forgotten his basic Newtonian physics. You can't have thrust in a vacuum. They eventually retract this on the day after we touched the moon. Um, <laughs> Members of the Ryan from Raumschiffart in Germany, they take notice. In the United States, we don't like technology until other people have copied it. The Germans, however, are very interested in this. And in 1930, in Berlin, um, Oberth fires his first liquid-fueled rocket. So 
He's read uh, Goddard's research, and he's uh, made refinements on it, so it's a more efficient rocket. It flies more stably. And the very interesting thing about Oberth is Werner von Braun is one of his research assistants. In fact, he's his primary research assistant. Um, he is Oberth's golden child. Uh, but rocket research has continu is, continues very rapidly. You know, Oberth keeps publishing papers. Goddard publishes papers in 1932 in Roswell, New Mexico. Oberth or excuse me, Goddard stabilizes his flights gyroscopically. So um, rockets are interesting in that they're very dangerous, and you primarily want them to go where you uh, don't, or you primarily don't want them to go places that you don't want them to go, and you want them to go where you don't want them to go, or, or something like that. Uh, <laughs> so you can put giant fins on them, but giant fins are heavy, and they only work while you're in an atmosphere. You can put a uh, control device in that's basically a, a, a spinning top, if any of you have ever played with those, and they sense inertial changes, and they allow you to build fins into the thrust of your rocket and adjust those fins so you can adjust the attitude of the rocket. Goddard is the first person to do that. Um, this flight goes up, uh, I think, three kilometers, something like that, so an extremely high flight, and it goes exactly on the path that was predicted for it. In 1934, in Kummersdorf, Germany, Goddard has published a paper, and the Germans are very interested in this. The von Braun Group, because Oberth has uh, been suggested to leave to Romania, because bad things are happening in Germany at this time, uh, the von Braun Group fires the Aggregat II into the North Sea. The Aggregat II is gyroscopically stabilized based on Goddard's design, but the Aggregat II goes much further and much higher because the Aggregat II uh, has a military budget behind it, so it's much larger. Um, and you, you can see it's a, a more complicated device than the thing that Oberth has designed. It's more complicated than any rocket that we've seen so far. In, 1930, in, in 1940, in Penemunda, Germany, uh, the A4 takes flight, or the Aggregat 4. So von Braun's group keeps doing their research, uh, and they have solved a very key problem, guidance. So they've not just managed to stabilize the rocket, but they're able to say that based on deflection in flight, the rocket can now correct its course and uh, reach an exact target. The von Braun Group has designed the Aggregat 4 to be a low Earth orbit or high atmosphere research device, but the funders have not really wanted it to be that, uh, but they have perfected the use of gyroscopic control. The funders, however, have a different idea. So the Aggregat 4 is also called the Verguntuswaffe 2. So um, that means the, the Vengeance Device 2. So you can, tell the people, you can tell the people that are funding this are not good people. Um, and in fact, the V2 was not used for peaceful purposes. It was not a research device. It was intended primarily to be a weapon. Um, in 1942, in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, mass production of U-235 begins. So the US project to construct a, nu a nuclear weapon is the largest practical R&D project in the nation's history up to this point. Um, takes hundreds of thousands of people, almost a billion dollars, and in 1945 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, that research actually pays off. As we all know, this was also not for peaceful purposes. So you see two world wars that have driven great research into basic practical R&D, but primarily not for peaceful purposes, or exclusively not for peaceful purposes in some cases. I don't know how you would use a nuke peacefully. Nuclear weapons pose a particular problem for the people that own them. It's real easy to kill yourself with them. <laughs> and all through the 50s, we're very concerned about this. And what's needed is a remote delivery mechanism. You can bazooka them. This is called a Davy Crockett. On the tip there is a nuclear weapon that has a two kiloton yield. Um, <laughs> You can shoot them out of an artillery cannon. This is the Big Bertha. It'll fire a, uh, it'll fire a nuke two kilometers down range. I hope the wind isn't wrong. <laughs> or you can drop them from a bomber, which is what we've done, or what we did with the two nuclear weapons that were actually dropped. But as yields increase on nuclear weapons, the problem with the bomber is you can't fly away in time. So you end up getting swept up in the uh, explosion. So it becomes a suicide mission. And the B-52 stratofortresses that the US did fly potentially to incinerate the world um, they were intended to be suicide missions. So you would just be irradiated and you would keep flying until you died from internal bleeding. All of this is much too close for comfort. Um, we tend not to want our airmen to die from internal bleeding. So in the late 40s, there were two options for delivering nukes to incinerate people. Uh, the first option was a hypersonic aircraft. So imagine if you can build a bomber that can go faster than the speed of sound and then just zooms by after it's dropped off the nuke on its way to drop off another nuke. The other option is a long-range rocket. So 
we have demonstrated that it's possible to launch from Penemuta, Germany, and strike Antwerp and London uh, relatively accurately, uh, even though that's not something that you could hit the Soviet Union with from the continental United States, that is an indication that there is research to be done there. Neither of these were available. We just couldn't do any of that. Nobody could do any of that. So, in 1946, Pine Castle Army Airfield, Florida, Jack Woolhams pilots the NACA-designed Bell X-1. So NACA is intended originally to be for private industry, but it becomes uh, this cooperation between private industry, uh, which has its own particular needs, and the US military, which has its own particular needs, and a lot of money. So it's able to fund research. So the, the, X or the X-1 is a drop craft, meaning that you drop it off at the bottom of a bomber, and it's fascinating because it's a rocket plane. It has no jet engine, it has no propellers. In fact, all it does is drop out of the, the, the bottom of a uh, bomber, turn its rocket on, and then stabilize itself in flight. It's intended to experiment with one thing, which is hypersonic flight. And in 1947, at Rogers Dry Lake, California, a pilot named Chuck Yeager hits Mach 1.07. So we are, in fact, able to have hypersonic aircraft. Now, this aircraft can really only do two things, keep itself from breaking up and carry Chuck Yeager while it's doing it. <laughs> but there, there's some juice here. We can actually do things with this. So the United States now has hypersonic aircraft. Um, you'll notice in this talk that I'm talking uh, very extensively about the United States. The Soviet Union is doing research at this time as well, but they're very secretive about it. So we're only just now getting uh, archives to let us understand what they were doing. And unfortunately, I don't read Russian, so I don't exactly know what the Soviets were up to at this time. If anyone reads Russian, please translate it all for me. Um, <laughs> there is a slight problem with hypersonic aircraft, and it's, it's that it's believed at this time that greater than 18 Gs of acceleration are fatal. Um, so all through World War II, it was just assumed that if you hit greater than 18 Gs, you would die. So no aircraft was designed to allow you to survive that because you were already dead. You had accelerated too much. But there were indications primarily because of Navy pilots slamming into conning towers that it was possible to survive more than 18 Gs of acceleration. So in 1948, at Edwards Air Force Base, um, Captain John Stapp survives 35 Gs on the G whiz. <laughs> It is a chair with rockets. <laughs> All the capillaries in Staff's eyes burst, filling them with blood. Now, before this ride, he had broken his wrist, he had broken his ribs, he had broken a leg. He had broken both of his collarbones twice. But he had never gone blind. And when his research assistants take him out of the gee whiz, he says to them, this time, boys, I get the white cane and the seeing eye dog. However, his eyes were just filled with blood, and he was only temporarily blinded. Eventually, the blood cleared up, his capillaries healed, and he was able to see again, and he died at a ripe old age in 1990. So, 1945, White Sands Missile Range, New Mexico. Now, the United States captured a lot of V-2s, and they've been studied extensively by the U.S. Army. Um, these rockets are significantly more sophisticated than the solid rockets that the Army used in the war. The Army, going into World War II, did not care at all about rockets. And then suddenly they realized that they wanted to shoot artillery over the horizon. And they didn't want to have to use a, a, a train-sized artillery weapon to do that, so they put solid rocket boosters on the back of an artillery shell that would be ignited by the cannon, and then they would fly themselves. But that's all they've got. Like, and those are not reliable, they do not go very far, and their payload is only the size of an artillery shell. But there's an indication that you can do more, and in 1946, Fort Bliss, Texas, Operation Paper Grip paper clip brings the Von Braun group to the United States. Now, in exchange for a clean slate, because these are Nazis, make no mistake, these are Nazis and they've done terrible things, paper clip refers to their actual records, they have fake records paper clipped over the top of that. Eventually, many of these men try and seek redemption for what they've done, um, but it is a complicated time. They bring the army up to speed on the V2 rocket. A lot of weird stuff was done out of fear of the Soviets. Uh, so they bring the, the army up to speed on the V-2 rocket, and in 1946, at White Sands Missile Range, the first V-2 sounding rocket flies. Now, a sounding rocket is a specific thing. It carries no payload. It's just intended to prove out the technology. So when people say sounding rocket, it's not doing anything other than not blowing up. Now, the V-2 is a single-stage rocket. So you see at the far, oh, on the left-hand side here is the payload. And that's the thing that's being carried to wherever the rocket is going. And the rest of it is the propulsion mechanism, the lift vehicle or the launch vehicle, depending on if you're putting a human up or a bomb up. 
Now, a single stage means this entire thing delivers itself to the location, which is a problem because the payload up at the top is relatively small. Single staging is an extreme limit on the efficiency of a rocket. But staging requires sophisticated coordination in the rocket control system itself. The rocket, independently of any human observer, has to be able to decide that it is no longer thrusting at one stage, so cut it off and do another thing. Nobody has quite been able to do that, but 1950, Cape Canaveral, Florida, one of the very first flights out of Cape Canaveral, Florida, the Bumper 8 delivers its payload 320 kilometers downrange. Now, when you have a multi-stage rocket, you're able to get more and more range with a smaller and smaller rocket. Now, it's not entirely true. There are obviously aerodynamic problems and things like that, but the more you can stage, the more efficient your rocket can be. Now, the, the Bumper 8 is a very interesting rocket because it is just a V2, with a WAC Corporal stuck on the top of it. A WAC Corporal is an Army solid rocket. It was the most sophisticated solid rocket the Army was able to conduct or to put together during World War II. So the US sophistication in rocketry advances very, very rapidly. And in 1953, in Huntsville, Alabama, the Army Ballistic Missile Agency flies its first Redstone. So the Army especially has been investing very heavily in intercontinental ballistic missiles. So the, the Redstone is a uh, multi-stage derivative of the V2 designed by the Von Braun Group. They are now the, Arm the ABMA, I'll just call them. Um, and these things are designed to deliver weapons of war across continents. So it's a war that you fight in 30 minutes and then you go back to the Stone Age. So semi-secretly, the Von Braun Group has used army money to build a low Earth satellite system. So the Redstone can lift, can lift a nuke, the payload is per spec, but it's not necessarily just a nuke. So Von Braun started out as a researcher. He started out under Hermann Oberth, who was a physicist, and almost all of his rockets have a peaceful purpose that are then co-opted for weapons of war. Um, in 1945, Bell Aircraft Corporation in the United in the United States proposes, Walter Dornsberger proposes a manned space plane. So there's been some indication that you can have in atmosphere rocket planes, but what about a rocket plane that goes out of the atmosphere and then comes back? So they primarily just want to study the reentry procedures in such a reusable craft. That has an appeal because you can actually reuse the thing. Someone flies it back. NACA bites and they start assembling the funding. So at this point, we've gotten up to the International Geophysical Year, which was a very interesting year occurs in 1957, and the U.S. announces at the first meeting that it will launch the first human artificial satellite. Four days later, the USSR announces that it will launch the first artificial satellite, and the space race is on. This marks the start of the space race. Now, here's a fun fact. Soviet nukes are heavier than U.S. nukes. Extra fun fact, Soviet rockets are bigger to make up for this. Now, the interesting thing about this is they're able to lift arbitrarily heavier things because of that. So, in 1957, from Balkanur, Kazakhstan, Sputnik 1 becomes the first artificial satellite. Now, for those of you that aren't uh, too up on when presidents existed, the president at this time was Eisenhower. He was a general. And Eisenhower's main concerns were uh, national security, national research and development, and prestige, in that order. So he's very concerned about security, research, prestige. So Eisenhower insists on a civilian-designed Vanguard rocket to carry our, uh, um, our artificial satellite into orbit because he wants civilian industry to be capable of doing something like this, and he wants to have NACA involved in doing it. Unfortunately, the Vanguard doesn't go well. There's not enough money, there aren't enough technical experts, and the damn things keep blowing up. So the United States seems to be rapidly be falling behind the Soviet Union. So in 1957, to remedy this, uh, in Washington, D.C., NACA becomes NASA. So uh, NASA is, is meant to take these disparate military programs because the Navy is doing its own thing, the Army is doing its own thing, the Air Force is doing its own thing, private companies are doing their own thing, and they get folded up into this new agency. So NASA is intended to be basic research and development for the benefit of, uh, for the benefit of private industry, but it's also intended to be a capable and able of doing its own work. So, NASA looks at all the NACA backlog of product or projects, and some of them survive, and some of them go into cold storage. One of them that goes into cold storage, for instance, is a uh, probe that lands on Mars. Uh, they were going to launch a probe in the early 1960s to touch Mars. It wouldn't have done much. It would have just sent a radio signal back, but we would have done it. Among the survivors, however, is an early stage proposal for a moon landing. So NACA, since the early 50s, has been thinking about how would we get on the moon. And their proposal 
uh, suggested that NACA would be able to land a single person on the moon by 1985. 1958, Cape Canaveral, Florida, Explorer 1 uh, launches atop of Juno. Explorer 1 is the first US satellite. So you can see 1957, 1958. It doesn't take long, and it doesn't take long because the Juno is an ABMA improvement over the ABMA Redstone. So the Juno is a weapon of war that's been ta taken and turned into uh, a weapon for science, or not a weapon for science, but <laughs> an, an object of science. It is a tool for science now. 1959, Edwards Air Force Base, California. Albert Crossfield pilots the first X-51 flight. Now this plane looks weird, and this plane looks weird for a couple of reasons. Um, the X-15 will prove out controlled re-entry techniques. It is a space plane, it is a rocket plane. It's a drop craft, it falls off the bottom of a, B, or falls off the bottom of a wing of a B-52 Stratofortress, kicks on its rockets, climbs all the way up out of the atmosphere, and then re-enters. And it'll test out new flight equipment as well, which we'll get to in a second. Now 1962, Huntsville, Alabama, all of these army projects that have been uh, told by uh, uh, the Eisenhower administration either to become part of NASA or to disappear, um, ABMA becomes the Marshall Space Flight Center. We might know it better by that name. Uh, the Marshall Space Flight Center is primarily responsible for all of NASA's lift vehicles, either taking commercial ones or military ones and upgrading them for the specific task at hand or developing their own. Now, the Marshall Space Flight Center is fascinating because they bring plans for an exceptionally large rocket. Originally, it was commissioned by the Army to heft a fusion bomb. Now, fusion bombs are basically train-sized devices at this point, so it's a rocket that's big enough to take a train into space and then back down again. But von Braun has semi-secretly designed a rocket that could heft a spacecraft to the moon. So the fascinating thing to me about von Braun is that he's uh, lived a very unfortunate life in that he has uh, continually been forced to through circumstance, not necessarily through moral problems of his own, design these weapons of war, but he always builds in research vehicles. And so the, the rocket that they design to lift a fusion bomb is the Saturn V. So 1961, Kennedy is president, and the Bay of Pigs, Cuba is the location, and the US is just back to failed invasion of Cuba. It was designed by Eisenhower, but carried out by Kennedy. Now, all through this time, and it's a huge international embarrassment, is em embarrassment. Now, Kennedy is an interesting president because his concern is international prestige, national security, basic research. And the Bay of Pigs is a huge uh, defeat in terms of prestige. Now, Kennedy, seeing that NASA is very impressive for a, a public regard standpoint, has been working closely with NASA regarding the missile gap. How do we improve this missile gap, this perceived notion that the Soviet Union has heavier lift vehicles and is capable of lifting heavier nukes to the United States? More than we can do it. Already we can incinerate the world. At this point, there's nuclear holocaust available to everybody. He's also been steadily briefed by his aides, his scientific aides, regarding NASA's proposed lunar mission, which they've been steadily developing and still believe at this point could be done um, by 1985 with the funding that they have. So Kennedy, in response to the Bay of Pigs, but also because of steadied briefing, delivers a speech in Washington, D.C. in 1961. And in this speech, he says, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or expensive to accomplish. We propose to accelerate the development of the appropriate lunar spacecraft. So it's already in progress. People are already working on it, and Kennedy recognizes that it would be incredibly impressive. It would show that international communism isn't as fun as international capitalism. So with a massive influx of money, NASA begins to aggressively run several different projects in parallel. Feeder projects are set up, uh, are established for Apollo. So the 1985 uh, projection was if we do this, 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 and this, we can get there by 1985. So NASA just goes, if we do all of these in parallel, we can get there by the end of the decade. So 1962, Edwards Air Force Base, California, the X-15 is flown by a fly-by-wire system. It is the first fly-by-wire system in the world. So the pilot does not directly control the craft because direct control of a craft on re-entry is a very difficult proposition. It's controlled by the computer. And the pilot flies the computer, which moderates his inputs for the craft. Incidentally, the first pilot to do that uh, to, uh, was intrinsically involved in the design, and that happened to be Neil Armstrong, who was standing there at the front of his aircraft. So the X-15 validates the interactive fly-by-wire systems, which was completely greenfield research when it started, 
and validates the decision that Apollo will be a fly-by-wire air or spacecraft, I should say. Um, that eventually becomes the Apollo guidance computer. The X-15 also underscores the need for careful rocket maintenance. So this is the X-15, this is the X-15A or 2AB or 2A, excuse me. And under that aircraft, right at the moment, is uh, pilot John McKay. His spine is crushed, and he will die in five years from his injuries. 1957 in Langley, Virginia. The wind tunnels and the shockwave photo photography uh, validates the re-entry shockwave on the Mercury capsule. So Mercury is designed to be a uh, prove-out ballistic capsule re-entry and retrieval. So you just launch a thing up, and it slams back through the atmosphere. And how do you design a, a heat shield for that? Mercury is, is called by the Mercury 7, the astronauts that are chosen to fly this thing, or, or rather ride in this thing, as man in a can. You don't do much, you don't control it, you're just there for the ride. 1962, low Earth orbit. John Glenn orbits the Earth three times and re-enters. His primary job is to take his temperature sensor and point it at the floor between his feet to get a read on how well the heat shield is doing. Mercury launches atop an Atlas rocket, and the Atlas is a very interesting rocket in that it's an uprated ICBM. So an ICBM is an intercontinental ballistic missile. It is intended to kill a lot of people, or lift a device that will kill a lot of people. So this is an Atlas rocket launching with a nuke on the top of it, and this is an Atlas rocket launching with John Glenn on the top of it. <laughs> As the flight plan for Apollo shapes up, it's clear that there are many unknowns. So NASA's a very careful engineering organization, and it realizes that it doesn't know how to go from Mercury to Apollo, and it would be extremely expensive to keep launching test Apollo crafts. So in 1961, Langley, Virginia, Gemini becomes the bridge between Mercury and Apollo. It's a precise re-entry craft. It's able to land in a precise location. It holds two crew. Before, Mercury could only hold one. In 1965, Gemini 4 in low Earth orbit, Ed White performs the first US EVA. EVA means he leaves the craft. Unfortunately, we don't know how to move around in space, and Ed White bounces around at the end of his tether. But we did it. Um, <laughs> the Soviets at this time know how to do it, but they're not telling us how to do it. 1966, Gemini 8, low Earth orbit. Neil Armstrong accomplishes the first dock in space. Now, it's, it's been said that Neil Armstrong is basically God's own pilot, and his uh, flight record has nothing to disprove that notion. In 1966, Gemini 12, low Earth orbit again. We're launching these very, very rapidly, three or four a year. Buzz Aldrin perfects the long duration EVA. He's able to move around very carefully in space. He's able to actually perform work, and he stays outside of his capsule for five hours, which is impressive because the heat radiation or the heat moderation in his suit is basically an ice pack on his back that sublimates to space and a bunch of tinfoil. So all throughout this, sounding Saturn Vs have been flown, and by this point, the Saturn V, the largest rocket ever flown to date and at present, is ready for the moon. It's ready to carry craft all the way out. And all the techniques that just 10 years ago were unknowns are finally ready. All of the parallel research, all of the money, all of the people that have died, three died in a fire for Apollo 1, all of those people, all of their sacrifices, and the hundreds of thousands who have been working for 20-hour days for a decade, everything is now ready. And in 1968, Apollo 8 orbits the moon for the first time. So humans have, have now orbited the moon. We've orbited several times, and uh, uh, humans have also left the Earth for the first time. This is the first crew of three people who have left the gravitational influence of the planet. In 1969, Apollo 10. Now, all throughout the Apollo project, there are these careful little steps that get taken. You know, here's an unknown, and here's all the knowns, Let's do a mission that solves this unknown. And Apollo 10, which all of these men are, are, are radical professionals, but if it was me, this would be very galling. Apollo 10 is intended to prove out the lunar module disconnection, trip down to the moon without landing, and trip back up. So the LEM, which is the lunar module, it's called LEM for historical reasons, descends to 14 kilometers above the lunar surface. At this point, it is the closest that humanity has ever gotten to touching down on an alien planet. It then comes back up and docks with the command module and they return home. So that checks out okay. So at this point, everything that could be done short of landing on the moon has been done. It's been a very careful, steady research project that's been going on for basically 70 years at this point. In 1969, Sea of Tranquility Moon, Neil Armstrong walks on the moon and he is the first man to do it. Buzz Aldrin shortly joins him and they, they are on the moon surface for basically six hours. They're primarily there to show that it can be done, that they won't sink into lunar dust. 
And so that's why Buzz Aldrin takes that famous footstep. Nobody knew what the lunar regolith was like. Um, there were some concerns that the, uh, the limb, when it touched down, would actually fall into dust and the astronauts would die there. So if you look at the limb, it has these gigantic feet to help distribute the weight. And Neil Armstrong, when he calls out and he says, I've taken one small, you know, he eventually says he's taken one small step. But he actually, the first thing he does is he kind of touches down like that to see what the regolith is made. <laughs> And almost all of the world celebrates. It's an incredible achievement. It's taken, uh, at the time they call it the free world. In the free world, almost every country has participated. So there's a huge global, uh, global celebration. Citing Apollo's high costs, however, Nixon, who was basically only concerned with Nixon, uh, approves a reusable space plane project, which is intended to be cheaper. That will eventually become, based off the research done with the X-15, the space shuttle. Uh, he funds it basically to one-tenth of what's it need, what it needs, so we didn't get the space shuttle that we should have had, we got the space shuttle that is the bargain basement budget version of it, and that's why it killed 14 people. He also cancels three Apollo flights. So Apollo is supposed to go to Apollo 20, it goes to Apollo 17 instead, because Nixon was concerned with Nixon, and Nixon was concerned with prestige and basically nothing else. So the, the trouble with Apollo for Nixon was that it was incredibly expensive, and we'd already done the prestige part. We'd already touched the moon and told the Soviets to fuck themselves, so why go anymore? <laughs> so, on July 20th, 1969, a quiet man from Ohio set foot on the moon. On December 13th, 1972, an outgoing man from Chicago was the last to step off of the moon. No one has been back since. We talk about the Apollo project as if it's too big to do it, ever do again. We talk about it cynically and we talk about it with disappointment. We talk about it with disappointment primarily in ourselves. Why do we do this? Why? Not necessarily why are we cynical about it, that I understand, but why do we have to talk about it like this? Why haven't we been back to the moon? Why is there no lunar base? Why haven't we been to Mars? We put probes past Pluto, why haven't people touched Pluto? Well, it's because progress takes time. Progress takes an extreme amount of time. Flying for 12 seconds is one thing. And the Wright brothers flew, and at no point did people come up to them and go, hey, that was real impressive, impressive but it would have been cooler if you had gone across the Atlantic Ocean. Flying across the ocean is an entirely different thing from achieving flight for the first time. And flying to the moon is a whole other. So that time span is 70 years. And it's not necessarily research that's driven toward that single goal. It's a variety of researches that through a peculiar uh, set of circumstances get condensed rapidly in about eight years time. So each step in this sort of like long-term engineering project, in this sort of prestige project, if you want to call it, or moonshots, as we now say, um, requires circumstance. You have to have all of this backlog, and it requires extreme effort and dedication by the participants. So we went to the moon, why not Mars? You know, why didn't we just heft a Saturn V with a crew all the way to Mars? Um, well, the interesting thing about the, the, the Apollo craft is that it had an, almost no radiation shielding protection. So if there had been a solar flare, what we would have gotten back were astronauts cooked in their spacesuits. Uh, the, the Apollo craft was almost fatal to the point of not quite being fatal, except the couple of times that it nearly was. So in Apollo 8, that went around the moon in just the command module, did not have the lunar module. Now, if any of you know about Apollo 13, the, the command module, or the service module, bit of it rather, a bit of it exploded. They lost their oxygen and they used the lunar module as a lifeboat. Now, if that had happened to Apollo 8, we would have dead astronauts orbiting the moon. Um, actually, they would have crashed by now uh, because of gravitational variation in the moon. Uh, Apollo 8, interestingly, was uh, also commanded by Jim Lovell. So Jim Lovell would have been real unlucky twice. <laughs> so as our ambitions increase, as we do a thing, you know, uh, the difficulty increases exponentially. So going across, you know, um, 450 feet of a beach in North Carolina is a radically different thing from going to the moon. It takes radically more people. You can't just do it with bicycle mechanics in a shop. One thing we don't know how to do is long-term space flight. You know, I mentioned the radiation problem. We, we don't really know how to solve that even yet. Uh, the Orion, what they're thinking about doing is the water tank will just have a little room inside of it that you can then sit inside of when there's a sunspot. So imagine hiding in one of these things for two hours, just a water tank with six other people. But we are learning. Oop, too far. <laughs> so to go back a little bit, this is, the, this is Skylab. It's, it's uh, a hydrogen tank from the Apollo project. 
with people inside of it. Um, <laughs> it is the most hacky thing. That, that golden thing there is a, uh, an umbrella, basically, because part of the radiator failed, and it would have cooked the people inside, so they launched people up to put that over the top of it. Um, it was still really hot in there. <laughs> this is Mir. It would occasionally catch fire on the inside. <laughs> And this is the International Space Station. Right now we have an astronaut up that's going to stay there for an entire year, and it'll be the longest duration space flight. We don't know what's gonna to happen to him. He has a twin, so we're gonna study him. <laughs> <laughs> we also don't know how to write safe software. We're real good at predicating a civilization on software, but we don't know how to do it well, especially when it really matters. You know, a valve that was supposed to open blew that rocket up. What was that valve controlled by? Software. How long had that software been verified? For almost two decades. Why had that missed? Because we haven't yet learned the math. We haven't le yet learned the engineering discipline to figure out how to do this stuff. You know, in aircraft, you see that where uh, you would have someone in 1910 who would very bravely go up in a thing of canvas and wood and then very bravely come back down, um, not necessarily in a controlled fashion. And right now we're at that stage with software. Uh, the other problem is we don't know how to do cheap launches. You know, the Apollo project was, was basically both the Soviet Union and the United States were shotgunning cash at the sky. Um, <laughs> every time you lit the candle, it cost $1 billion. So going uphill on the Apollo candle cost you $1 billion a launch. But we don't know how to do it cheaply yet. We are learning better machining methods, better control methods. So the SpaceX Dragon X, which hasn't flown yet, but parts of it have flown, is supposed to cost <laughs> $0.16 billion, which is not quite one-tenth of the cost, but is an extreme improvement to the point where we can now conceive of launching, oh, um, they're called CubeSats, but they're basically cell phones with a solar array on the top. So private citizens, who are really rich, can do their own space, uh, they can do their own satellite research organizations, or light sail, which was a CubeSat with a solar sail on it, um, which is uh, Carl Sagan's originally, his foundation, which then became uh, Bill Nye after Sagan uh, sadly died. So at this point, you know, we're still learning quite a bit of stuff, and there's a lot we don't know how to do. We just don't know how to do so much, and we are not willing to take test pilots and stick them in a tin can and hope they don't die. Nixon, for the Apollo 11 flight, wrote two speeches. One he read, which was, you know, yay, we did it, uh, fuck you Soviets. And then the other one was a condolence to the nation for the death of the brave astronauts whose bodies we commend to the moon. We don't do those sorts of things anymore, primarily because we're doing more science. It's not just a prestige project. So our ambitions for spaceflight have radically increased. So the difficulty, even now, of getting to the moon, a private organization could do it. Nobody's gonna spend the money to do it, but we could touch the moon again. Um, you just need $43 billion. But we are figuring out how to do it. We are figuring out how to make cheap launches. We are figuring out how to make safe software. And we are figuring out how to redo all of these things that we once did very dangerously, made out of canvas and wood, or uh, in the case of the Apollo project, Apollo project um, a tin can with kerosene on the bottom of it. Uh, we're figuring out how to do these things better very slowly and surely. So this probe is uh, the, it's a dramatic photo to my mind. It's a deep space weather. It's out past the orbit of the moon. Previously, that was inconceivable. It's not quite in a Lagrange point, but it's an extremely heavy craft. It was launched for uh, $120 million. If we had done that in the 1960s, it would have cost $10 billion. So from the time of the 1960s to now, we've been able to cut the cost of a weather satellite that'll save millions of lives because of weather detection by almost a factor of 100. And this is the thing we left on the moon. So, you know, you take all of these weapons of war, and then we do it. We touch the moon, and we don't leave a sign that tells, you know, people like, ah, we did it. We say that here men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon, and we came in peace for all of mankind. So you have this century that's incredibly violent, and all of the technology that was designed to make this possible was re were really just tools of war. So the, the primary thing we haven't yet learned how to do is how to build big, expensive things without wanting to kill each other with them. <laughs> but we're learning that too, I think. Uh, the Earth, even though it doesn't seem like it has gotten more peaceful, uh, it, it just turns out that wealth equity or equality is now normally distributed instead of being spiked at one end. So maybe 
you know, in 150 years, we'll actually be able to have nice things. <laughs> Thank you. Brian, that was the best presentation I've ever seen. That was fantastic. More, come on, that was great. Come on, that was a fantastic presentation. What a great ending for the day. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. That was beautiful. Um,